Hey friends, Camaro Theologian here. I am uh, really excited that you guys join me each week and listen to these. These are just, oh gosh, you could call them my ramblings, my thoughts, my teaching. I do a lot of stuff in the car. <laughs> I, I uh, uh, obviously take care of looking at the road, but while I'm driving, I, I think a lot. Some of you may be like me, but that's where you do the most of your thinking. And I really enjoy driving and I, I enjoy driving around, listening to music, and just thinking about things, praying. And it's usually where I come up with any type of epiphanies while I'm putting stuff together. I don't learn in such a way where I read and read and read and read. I read and then think about things for a long time. I have to integrate, and it takes me a while to integrate. It's the type of, the type of um, uh, personality that I am. Uh, some of you guys are more informational, some of you are more integrational like me, and some of you are more uh, uh, take things in through your emotions and understand them that way. Uh, this is just the way that I think. I'm very integrational, and this is where I do my thoughts. And so you join me here uh, for my integration of theology. Well, it always comes down to some type of current event in my life that makes me start thinking, obviously. That's why I'm thinking about things, and that's why you hear these things. Not so much because I have a list of things that I want to talk about with you all, but so much because I'm just in my car thinking. So today, today we are going to have to put on our thinking cap. This is going to be very integrational. This is going to be very difficult for a lot of you. Maybe it's the first time you will have ever heard these concepts, and some of you that have heard them will understand that even though you hear them, you don't really have them all put together. These are just place but theological uh, uh, handles, if you will, for what the reality is behind them. Well, let me quit talking about all that and get straight to the subject. The subject here is open theism. Uh, the reason why I'm doing this is because uh, while I was teaching the other night, there was a certain gentleman who was an open theist, and uh, always gets me thinking, you know, whenever somebody holds to a view that um, is traditionally different than uh, the traditional view of God or the traditional view of things. Sometimes we call this heterodoxy, different teaching. Heterodoxy, uh, not heresy. Heresy is where it's at a damnable offense, like you denying Jesus, denying who he is, denying what he's done for you, denying that you're a sinner, that kind of stuff. That's heresy. Uh, heterodoxy is whenever you have departed from a traditional view of God that is normally thought to be correct or just theology. Open theism is one of those that is a heterodoxy. It is, it is different than that uh, traditional view, very different, in that it sees God as a member in time. Uh, that God is experiencing time in his essence just like we are. Now, a lot of this stuff has to be defined because you've got to get these placeholders down. Whenever I say in his essence, that is not just a passing statement. Whenever I say in his essence, what I mean by that is in his ontos. This is called ontology. You may have heard that before, learned about ontology in school. But ontology is the study of the stuff, the, the study of the what stuff actually is. What is the ontology? What is the ontology of me? Well, I'm skin and I'm bone and, you know, I, I, I have an existence in space. I have an extension in space. Uh, I have, uh, I experience time, that sort of stuff. What is the stuff of the, the bed that I sleep in? Well, it's a mattress, material, springs, that sort of stuff. It's the actual stuff uh, behind what it is that you call it. Well, the ontology of God has always been thought of as the one who brought time, space, and matter into existence. Now, if that is the case, if the stuff of God is beyond that, then God does not experience time. Otherwise, you know, uh, when did he create time? How did he do it? I mean, he can't be under the tyranny of time as if time is really the God, the impersonal God above him that he has to submit to. And he has a certain amount of time to get stuff done and, you know, to, to complete his tasks. That is not the way God is. God is the creator of time. Time came from him, not from inside of him, his ontology, but came from nothing. We call this creation ex nihilo, creation from nothing. God created time from nothing, not out of himself. God created matter, stuff, 
the stuff that we see, the, the trees, the dirt, the, the uh, rocks, the, the, uh, all the material of the known universe, he created that out of nothing, not out of himself. Uh, and there's a few things I'm emphasizing. Maybe you think I'm overemphasizing them, but hopefully you'll be able to see why this is so important. So we're trying to get some difficult placeholders down in order to understand what it is that we're going to be talking about and ultimately be confused. And uh, you leave here today in a confused position and you're, you're right there with the rest of historic Christianity and really historically anybody who's ever believed in a, in a good view of God or traditional view of God. He created time, matter, and space. Space is something that hasn't existed, that he's inside space, that his stuff, his actual existence is inside space and he can move around because he doesn't have an extension. He doesn't have stuff. You have to have matter in order to have space. You have to have matter in space in order to have time because time is simply a measurement of movement. Movement of what? Movement of stuff. Movement where? In space. So you see, they're all corollary. You have to have time, space, and matter together. And whenever you have God in one, he is in all of them. So therefore, whenever you have God entering into time or being in time, you have him basically being um, a, a subject to these things uh, in, in, a, in a very real sense. And he, he can't have you know, uh, the idea of being outside of time where you don't experience a succession of moments, then suddenly say, you know what, I'm going to go ahead and enter time. Uh, because then you have the when issue. When did he do this in his eternal now? Did he do it before the eternal now, after the eternal now, in the middle of the eternal now? See, if he's in an eternal now, there can't be a time in which he changes. We call this the immutability of God. God does not change. Why? Not because he decides not to change. He's like, man, I'm telling you, I'm really going to do everything I can today to stay the same because I want to fulfill my promises. And I think I can do it today. It's because he can't change man, I'm introducing some big stuff because now I just said God can't do something. And that's true. He can't. God can't do certain things. He can't change. That's impossible. If he changed, he would not be God by very definition. He'd just be a really powerful being in our present universe, a superhero. He can't change. And so therefore he doesn't experience time. He doesn't experience change. He doesn't become something that he uh, hasn't always been. Now, you say all this stuff and you say, Michael, where are you getting all this stuff? Well, it's, it's stuff that is within, um, uh, not, not so much in the Bible. And I know this may surprise some of you guys, but the Bible just assumes this. The Bible doesn't have to make arguments for certain things that are already assumed within nature. The Bible does not make an argument for God's existence for instance. Nowhere in the Bible can you find an argument that God exists. Now, yes, God, that God is the one true God, but not that he exists. Um, it's always assumed, and that is within nature. So whenever you've got this traditional view of God that is built, it is not built by Christians who've read the Bible over and over again and finally come to the conclusion that God must be outside of time, space, and matter. Um, you've got it built from philosophy, from nature, from the necessity of things. And some called God the necessary being, not because the Bible calls him that, but because philosophy makes it necessary. In order for God to be God, he has to have certain characteristics. And without these characteristics, he's no longer God. So one of those characteristics, timelessness, one of them spacelessness, one of them is uh, matterlessness. And uh, this uh, all uh, necessitates immutability. Without those things, you're not talking about God anymore. You've redefined the term God in order to make him something else. And yes, you can call him a superhero. You can call him, you know, just a really super powerful being who can do just about anything uh, within our current universe. Um, and, and that's fine, but he, he's under the tyranny of these components of time, space, and matter. And therefore, he is not God. He is not the creator of all things, just most things. If time is taken out of the equation, everything else is as well. That is philosophy. Again, let, let me give you a passage in the Bible where I do get this from. 
uh, Romans chapter one, it says, for, for since the creation of the world, his eternal attributes have been clearly seen, being understood through what has been made so that people are without excuse. Now notice this, the, it's, it doesn't say, it's so important what it doesn't say here, it doesn't say since the creation of the Bible, God's attributes can be clearly seen. No, it says from the creation of the world. Well, where do we get it from, from the world? We get it from nature, uh, his, his eternal attributes, his divine power, his, his divine nature, who he actually is, the phusis, uh, the Greek word for this is, the stuff, the ontos, that what his stuff actually is, is clearly seen, being understood through everything, what has been made, what necessitates these things. Ooh, deep breath. I mean, that is so much stuff, isn't it? This is one of the, I mean, this is one of the most fundamental first principles of all theology and all Christianity that oftentimes we just skip over because it does blow our mind. But we cannot. It's so essential that we don't because from here we build everything else we know about God and we place every event in the Bible within that framework. Yes, the Bible follows a framework that we have preconceived. And what I mean by that is there's certain things that, again, that the Bible doesn't teach us that we bring to the Bible in order to understand the Bible. Hopefully I'm still teaching. <laughs> I think I am. <laughs> uh, hopefully there's things that we understand that the Bible teaches that we that uh, we, we already understand because we have done our pre-work, the stuff beforehand. For instance, you come to the Bible and there's uh, literacy. You have to have a literacy to understand it. It just doesn't become a part of your mind just by it being there. You have to read it. You have to process it. Well, how do you process it? We process it first by understanding sentences and, and concepts that, that are taught within literacy. Subject, verb, object, relationship, all that. Where does all that come from? How do you learn subject, object, verb, relationships and, and how it is that you process things in your mind and, you know, the law of non-contradiction that, that one thing cannot be another thing at the same time in the same relationship. Where we learned these are all learned in nature God expects us to read the book of his nature and and in that we find the rules the groundwork for being able to think through all kinds of things since creation of the world his invisible attributes have been clearly seen what are the invisible attributes well the invisible attributes are his uh, his uh, eternal existence, his immutability, his timelessness, those uh, the spacelessness, all of these things that he is not made up of matter, that he doesn't have actually have a hand in his ontos, a foot in his ontos, an eye in his ontos. In his actual being, there is no time, space, or matter, no extension in space. That's what's supposed to blow your mind because you don't have anything to compare it to. You can't say it's like. God is like nothing. And whenever he, so we say that uh, he is different, we, we got to understand what we're saying by that. Karl Barth called God the holy other, the W-H-O-L-L-Y, the holy other, the completely other. And again, sometimes that's the first principle that we miss. And if we miss that kind of stuff, we might come to the Bible and start reading it and say, you know what? I think God is in time. And I think he's acting and reacting. And thus we come to this concept of open theism. Open theist, I, I, there, there's a lot of open theists that I know. Um, I've um, uh, met Gregory Boyd, he's a, he's a strong open theist. I've had interviewed him before. I think he's a great guy, a, a very deep thinker in so many areas. I just think he misses the boat here and it's an important boat to miss. Um, to Clark Pinnock, before he died, he was a wonderful man, just kind as could be. I think, uh, you know, when we see him in heaven, we'll be able to correct him on all his views about God, but uh, uh, God will have corrected him already. But, uh, you know, that this is a very wrong view, and it distorts everything that comes afterwards in a very particular way. 
Now, why do people believe in open theism? Well, there's a lot of reasons. The, one of the emotional reasons that grabs you at the first, and the, one of the main reasons you see people talk about it, and the rationale that they give is because they can't, in the, in the, and the problem of suffering and pain, they can't imagine that God would allow things that that is so terrible, so heinous, as a as a raping and a kidnapping of a of a little girl, something so incredibly bad. He knew about it, and he didn't stop it. So you can take away a few things from God at this point. You can say, well, he knew about it, but he didn't have the power to stop it. Uh, you take away his power and you got a different God. You'd have the power to stop it. People will say, no, no, that doesn't sound right because he's all powerful and he's able to do all things. Well, let's take about, let's take away his knowing about it. And this, we come to open theism. They've taken away God's knowing about the future um, as if it is set. And therefore the future is open to change. And God is interacting within this this uh, time space matter continuum because he necessarily interacts with it. He necessarily is inside of it. So what do you have there? We well, have again, I mean, you can imagine in your thoughts, you have a completely different view of God. I didn't say a completely different God. Again, I'm not saying that open theists aren't Christian. They're doing the best they can to to work through and process some very difficult stuff. I just think they process it in such a, such a bad way. They try to solve problems that can't be solved. Uh, the, the pro there's some certain problems within the universe that just, we are not going to be able to solve them. And I know they frustrate us in many ways, but whenever you talk about, you know, God's, God's sovereignty and human responsibility, you try to get rid of one or the other, and you're not going to be able to solve it. You're, you're going to end up in a heterodoxy of some sort, sometimes even a heresy. Um, whenever you try to solve the Trinity, that he is one God and three persons, and try to come up with all kinds of illustrations and stuff, and you, if you ever have an aha moment with the Trinity, believe me, that is a dangerous spot to be, because nobody's ever had a real aha moment and been correct. If you ever have an aha moment with the, the idea that God is interacting with us, yet is in his essence, uh, above, beyond, transcendent, wholly different, separate than everything in existence. If you ever have an aha moment say, I understand it now, I'm telling you, you're in a bad, bad spot. I understand why we try to understand it. I understand why we feel we need to understand it because it is frustrating not to understand things. But in the Bible, it says the secret things belong to the Lord, but those revealed belong to us. Now, there's going to be secret things, and they belong to him. And we try to solve every secret thing because we don't like the secret things. Nobody likes the secret things. Nobody likes things we don't know. Nobody likes things we can't figure out. And so we do our best to figure it out. And I'm not saying we don't do our best to figure everything out. We do. It's only responsible. We never just punt to um, uh, what's called apophatic theology, theology of mystery. We never just punt to apophatic theology, but we we concede it whenever it is obviously there. And this is an apophatic issue. One we can't understand. One that is a mystery. One that will always remain a mystery, at least while we're here on the earth. Maybe on the other side, God will explain things to us, but I doubt it. I think there'll always be a big area of apathetic theology that we're going to have to concede to and trust God in. And so God has all these things that we can't figure it out. He must be outside of time in order to be God, but he does actually interact with us and have emotional responses to things inside of time. How do those two things work together? If you can explain that, once again, you've got problems. All we can do is hold them both tightly in tension. They are not contradictions. Contradiction uh, violates the, the rule of logic and would violate everything I'm talking about here today. Um, a contradiction is something that says, you know, one plus one can equal three and two at the same time in the same relationship. That's impossible. 
Uh, even God can't make it do that because the rules of logic are part of God. They didn't come out of nothing. They are part of who he is. They're part of his character. And so they will exist forever and are forever correct, just like God exists forever and forever is correct. So rationality, whenever you say God has to follow by the rules of rationality, all you're doing is saying God has to follow by the rules of himself. And that's true. He can't be other than he is. He will always be the same. That's why he named himself. That's why he called it and told us his name as Yahweh, the being one, the one who is. Not the one who's becoming like us, not the one who was, but the one who just always is. He's in the eternal now, and he's the being one. But at the same time, just a little bit later to Moses, after he introduces Moses, his name is the being one, he passes by Moses in the cleft of the rock, and he calls out his name, loving kindness, forgiveness, those kind of things that are that are responses within the world. He's got his transcendent nature, which is his being, his essence, his ontos, that is above time, space, and matter. And that is the one that is, that is the being one. And then you've got his imminent nature, the one that's close to us, the one that's imminent within creation, and the one that's expressing, ex expressing emotion and reaction to things. Both of those are true, completely true, not in a contradictory way, but in a way that exists in tension. The problem with open theism is they have to solve one of them and they solve they solve the one that say well he must not be transcendent he must only be imminent and once you cross out the transcendence of God as I said before you've got a, a different God uh, definition of God altogether a different God again God tolerates us in our wrong views and I'm thankful he does he tolerates me probably in a lot of wrong views I'm just not sure which ones they are they are yet I hopefully would change them but I don't know and he tolerates us in our wrong view and if I'm correct and open theism is wrong I'm not saying open theism can't be saved I'm just saying it is a very destructive to your theology and whenever it integrates with everything else will mess things up and leave you not just confused because we're going to be confused a lot but leave you stranded without the hope that God truly offers in the knowledge of him let him who rejoice rejoice in this that he understands and knows me uh, once you have that messed up you can't really rejoice quite the same but to know God as God, the the transcendent one, the being with the one uh, that never is in time, never will be in time, as Paul says, whom no eye has seen nor can see. What a great statement by Paul to Timothy. No eye has seen or can see. We've got that. The Yahweh, the being one. And then you've got the one who is in time interacting with us, the imminent one. Both of those together. Hold those tightly. And then you'll hold the true Christian theology. Let either one of those go, and you have departed significantly from not only the truth, but uh, the historic Christian faith. So thanks for listening, guys. I hope that this has been beneficial to you, talking about open theism and the nature of God. Um, if you leave here confused, once again, join the crowd.